Support for this NPR podcast and the following message come from Lyft, reminding listeners that they could be relaxing in a Lyft ride right now, listening to Beethoven or something. Lyft provides rides as relaxing as the buttery, smooth voice of a public radio announcer. Lyft, it matters how you get there. Download and ride today. Thanks for listening to What's Good with Stretch and Bobbito. More than 40 million Americans speak Spanish, and millions more are learning. For all of you, I'd recommend NPR's Radio Ambulante. It's the podcast to hear incredible stories from all over Latin America and across the U.S. Hosted by novelist Daniel Alarcón, Radio Ambulante covers the region like no one else. Reporting and storytelling en español. Radio Ambulante is on NPR One or wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's podcast may contain some explicit language. You're warned. There's a neighborhood in Miami called Little Managua. I'll go and I'll buy all the Nicaraguan goodies and I'll, you know, <laughs> look, man, it's noon. We are taping this thing at noon. Can we not talk about food right now? <laughs> I haven't had breakfast. My stomach is literally... You look like you haven't had breakfast ever. I mean... <laughs> Hey everybody, this is Stretch Armstrong. And I'm Bobito Gossi, a.k.a. Cool Bob Love. Welcome to Stretch and Bobito. Sorry, what's good with Stretch and Bobito? <laughs> your source for untold stories and uncovered truths from movers and shakers around the mundo. The voice you just heard is that of CNN correspondent Anna Navarro. Anna is a Republican strategist, and while we might not always agree with our guests, we always hear him out. We're going to talk to her about how her background has influenced her personal politics and how she connects with her homeland, Nicaragua. Bob. Yes. Boricua, brother. Sí. Que, que. How do you connect with your homeland? Dímelo. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's an interesting question because as a youth not born in Puerto Rico, where my, both my parents were, I felt very disconnected um, and not growing up speaking Spanish. Uh, and being a New, New Yorkian, I really traveled a dubious path on trying to sort of confirm my identity as a Puerto Rican. I had the great, great honor of playing professionally for Los Lo Capitanes de Arecibo, which is one of the, uh, the franchises there. And I think when I was there and I was recognized as one of the top 100 ball players in the world uh, who were of Puerto Rican descent, that really affirmed a lot for me. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, I had never felt as Puerto Rican as that. And it was kind of like a badge of honor. It was like, yo, I'm playing pro ball. I'm representing the island. I'm representing uh, an entire city on my chest every time we play. And then moving forward uh, in the last 10 years, I taught myself, Stretch, how to speak Spanish on my own. Beautiful. I remember you telling me how you were really uncomfortable speaking Spanish in public. And, you know, we went down to Bogota, Colombia. Oh, yeah. You were, you were getting the crowd going, speaking Spanish, lovely. Like, with yeah. total confidence and bravado. And it was it was really great to watch, man. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Well, that's all, you know, because when you're on a mic at a party, you just have to do, like, one sentence at a time. Applause, all. Applause, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be back to talk with Anna about her political commentary and Boom. what it's like to be a Latina in the limelight. Ha ha! Support for this NPR podcast and the following message comes from Blue Apron. Blue Apron partners with sustainable farms, fisheries, and ranchers to bring you all the ingredients you need to create incredible home cooked meals. Ingredients compared with an easy-to-follow recipe card delivered to your door weekly in a refrigerated box. Rediscover how fun cooking can be while enjoying specialty ingredients and exploring new flavors and cuisines. Get your first three Blue Apron meals free with your first order, plus free shipping by visiting blueapron.com slash stretch. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Red Bull Radio. Whether it's the latest dance hall out of Kingston, techno from Berlin, underground hip-hop, or old soul gems, Red Bull Radio is the place to tune in and discover great music that's new to you. With in-depth interviews and live performances from festivals around the globe, plus music handpicked by influential artists, journalists, and DJs, you'll know what you're looking for when you hear it. Listen at RedBullRadio.com. 
Our guest today is one of the most unexpected voices in the GOP. She's Latina, an immigrant, and she can't help but to keep it 100 all day, every day, even if that means being a vocal critic of the president and her own party. She's been a strategist for Republicans for years. Navarro served as an advisor to John McCain's 2008 presidential campaign and as an advisor to John Hutzman in 2012. She's also been a teacher at Harvard University, was a special advisor to the government of Nicaragua, and today she's a political commentator on CNN. That's a whole lot right there. Mm. Well, let me let me correct you though. I wasn't a teacher at Harvard. I was a fellow. That means I'm, I mean I'm only smart to be there for one semester. <laughs> <laughs> So um, inevitably, we're going to talk about politics, but let's let's just talk about you for a moment. Since you were eight years old, you've called Miami your home, mm-hmm. and you you know some pretty cool people in Miami. We hear that you're friends with <coughs> Emilio and Gloria Estefan. Is that true? And how did you get to know them? I really don't remember uh, how I got to know them, uh, but they are very good friends, and I'm very proud of them. They are uh, Emilio is an amazing entrepreneur. But and so successful, so famous, have done so many things, and yet the most grounded, accessible human beings you can imagine. I'll text her while, I'll, while I'm here, tell her I'm here talking about her. Um, it's interesting. She just got told she's going to be receiving a Kennedy Award, a Kennedy Center Award, and she's going to be using the opportunity, she said, to um, teach Donald Trump a thing or two about immigration. So, Anna, um, you moved to the United States in 2000. I'm sorry. You moved to the United, United States when you are eight years old. I was thinking about my mom. Yes, yes. That was in 2000. <laughs> 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 my mom moved to the United States when she was eight years old as well. From where? From Puerto Rico. Uh-huh. And uh, she was a hibara, grew up on a farm, you know, milk cows and all that. That's a term I don't know. Uh, a hibara is, you know, <laughs> so, someone who doesn't grow up in a city. Okay. Yeah. And um, But she moved to New York, and she, she retained some of what she had growing up, but she lost a lot of it. I'm wondering, what were the special qualities of Nicaragua that when you arrived in in the U.S. really early on that you wanted to hold on to? You know, I, I, I was only eight years old, right? So I wasn't in a mind frame to be thinking about what am I holding on to or not. I grew up in a very Nicaraguan family, a very Nicaraguan household where we ate Nicaraguan, where we talked in Spanish, where this was during the Civil War in Nicaragua. It was the decade of the 80s. Uh, Ronald Reagan, the Contras, the Freedom Fighters. My father was a Freedom Fighter. Um, so the politics of Nicaragua and all of that struggle was very much part of my daily life at home. I also live in Miami, which is a community where there's constantly an influx of new immigrants. A lot of us fleeing political distress, whether it's the Cubans who came in 1960s or it's you know the Nicaraguans in the 80s or the Haitians or the Venezuelans now, Argentines, Colombians. You know, whenever the shit hits the fan in Latin America, people head to Miami because we do Latin food really well there. We do Latin music really well there and we drive really bad there so people feel very much at home and um, and because we open up doors for each other um, and so you know Miami is is one of these places where diversity is in our blood where you know if you want to go have a, a Nicaraguan breakfast a Cuban lunch and an American diner uh, dinner you do and so um, so I feel like I was able to not only hold on to the Nicaraguan culture but also assimilate into the American culture while at the same time embracing all of these other cultures that are part of, uh, of Miami. People say to me all the time, when did you know that you had fully become an American? And I say, the day I realized I loved peanut butter. <laughs> peanut butter, you know, there is no such thing as peanut butter outside of the America. It's one of these things where, and, and I remember when I first came to the United States, I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> What is this gooey thing that sticks to your mouth, tastes terrible, and are they really putting it in between two pieces of white bread with jelly? I mean, the entire thing was just so horrifying to my, to my, my aesthetics, my palate, everything. And now, you know, I mean, you know, it's like comfort food. I eat it all, you know, with a spoon out of a jar in the middle of the night when I'm, you know, when I think we might, we might be going into nuclear war. <laughs> So I I read that when you got to Miami, it was never your family's plan to stay in Miami. There was always this idea that when things get right back at home, you'll return. At what point did you realize that that was not what was going to happen and you were going to indeed be an American? Well, you know, um, 
I think that happens to all political exiles. I think you, when you flee um, political turmoil, you always think that you're going to go back home. And, um, and my parents actually did. After my parents went back to Nicaragua, there was a change in the government in 1990. And my parents went back. There was an, an election, a democratic election. The Sandinistas, the left-wing dictators, lost. And, uh, and my parents went back immediately, within months. I was graduating from high school. I was going to college. And at some point, you know, during that time in college, then law school, I realized uh, my life is here. My, my, my work is here. My life is here. My interests are here. Um, and, you know, and, and this is where I want to be. This is, uh, this is home. So my parents and a lot of my family did go back and live there. And, uh, and I'm in Miami. In the midst of that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what ties you back to Nicaragua? Well, I go back often to visit family. I have, you know, we have properties, we have farmland, we have businesses that have been in the family for, for generations. So they mean something, um, you know, beyond beyond just the present. You know, it's also part of my, my past. Um, my brother who I adored, is buried there. Mm -hmm. So it's always good. You know, so for me, that's, that's such a significant part of my being. Uh, what ties me back to Nicaragua? There's, a, there's an area, there's a neighborhood in Miami called Little Managua, which is the capital of, uh, of Nicaragua. It's called Managua, and there's it's a place called Little Managua. And I'll go and I'll buy all the Nicaraguan goodies and I'll, you know, um, what are stock they? up. You know, um, meat, churrasco with chimichurri, plantains. And then, you know, my favorite thing, the little coconut candies. I mean, look, man, it's noon. We are taping this thing at noon. Can we not talk about food right now? <laughs> I haven't had breakfast. My stomach is literally... You look like you haven't had breakfast ever. I mean, do you all know how skinny this man is? He's vegan. Leave him alone. I don't even know what vegan is. <laughs> like, I know Bill Clinton is that, so... Stevie that. Wonder is. Okay. <laughs> if it involves quinoa or kale, I'm not in. <laughs> guilty, guilty as charged. <laughs> oh man. Um, so you've said in other interviews that from a very young age you wanted to be a Republican. But was there a particular moment growing up when you said to yourself, "I want to be in politics"? I wanted to be a Republican because my father was uh, in the contrast a freedom fighter um, in, in Costa Rica on the border with Nicaragua. And I remember the moment at a State of the Union when Ronald Reagan was giving the State of the Union and he was giving support to the, the freedom fighters and he said, I am a freedom fighter too. And so that kind of sealed the deal for me at that, at that time. Um, was there a moment when I said I wanted to be in politics? I was always in politics as a child, you know, volunteering at stuff, going to political marches because we did that then, you know. And, I mean, in Miami, we always have a reason to march, which is amazing because it's 100 degrees and 100 degree humidity. <laughs> and But yet, you know, we, I mean, we back then we would march at the you know, drop of a pin. And... Um, and so it just, you know, it was, I don't think there was an aha moment. I think it was organic and it was part of, look, when you, when you flee communism, you realize you cannot take democracy for granted. And you realize the value of being engaged and trying to make a difference. So I lived through a civil war when I was six, seven years old. I fled communism when I was eight years old. I grew up in a community that is full of other exiles who also fled political turmoil and, and, um, and communism. Being a bystander for me is not an option. Boom. <laughs> Th that answers the next question. Yeah. <laughs> that answers like five questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna, you've been a commentator on CNN and CNN Español. Uh -huh. When you're switching to either language or either platform, What's your shift when you go between the two? I don't know. I don't think it's a. I don't think it's a cognizant thing. I don't think I'm conscious of it. I think for me, it's a seamless translation, uh, a seamless transition. I mean, you know, I grew up in Miami. Our official language is Spanglish, um, <laughs> so I, I. It's just not something I think about consciously. It just. It just comes. Uh, 
comes natural. Si tú quieres, hablamos español ahora y confundimos al americano. <laughs> Vamos. <laughs> In a BuzzFeed profile, you said, quote, people who like me would tweet about my sexy Latina accent. People who hated me would tweet about my irritating Mexican accent. Hell, I didn't even know I had an accent. Everybody in Miami talks like me. So how tricky is it to handle people's expectations of you as a Latina who is so visible? Oh, I don't care. Look, at some point you've got to stop caring about people's expectations and care only about your expectations of yourself. Uh, social media can be very cruel. And so you've got two choices. You either learn to have it roll off your back or, you know, you crawl under your bed and suck your thumb for the rest of your mm. life. To me, it just, I mean, I just, it doesn't, it doesn't get to me at all. One of the good things about having more and more followers is that at some point you can't keep up with it. So you're not reading all of the venom. There comes a moment like this aha moment where you consciously turn it off, turn the switch off, and you stop caring. I am basically in that mode right now. I mean, you know, you could hurl any insult at me and I'd be like, eh, eh, next, meh. I'm bored. <laughs> what else? I mean, also, there is really nothing new that I can be told that I haven't already sure. been told sure. a million times <laughs> in different languages. But on the flip side of that, though, do you get numb to the love? Because, I mean, if, if there's all these overwhelming, you know, man, like, I love what you do. You represent us. And or does every time that you read it, you feel like, mm, yeah, I'm doing something right. You know, I don't get numb to the support and the love. Uh, it means a lot to me. The other day, something that I loved happened. I was scrolling through responses. When, when I'm on planes on long flights, I, you know, I, I sometimes do that. And there was, um, uh, uh, I had taken a picture with a guy at the airport who had asked for a picture. He posted it. I reposted it. And then this guy wrote, you know, in and said, the goal in my life is to get my 81-year-old mom to meet Anna Navarro. Oh, I yeah. set up a Twitter feed for her just so she could follow her. So I, de you know, I, oh. I contacted him, asked for his mom's uh, number. And now, you know, Marjean from Lubbock, Texas, and I are new best friends. Get out. Call Aww. her up. Of course, now, you know, and then I tweeted about Marjean, who had never sent out a tweet. Now Marjean uh -huh. is famous, has got Stop. thousands of followers, <laughs> and, and every follower of mine wants me to call their elderly parent who, you know, lives alone with their cats. <laughs> But it's, it was it was like the most you know terrific uh, no, terrific thing. Yeah, that's super so it's, affectionate. Look, um, having a platform gives you the ability to to just sometimes with random acts of kindness, just you know things that are maybe you know take just a few minutes, make somebody happy and make make a difference in people's lives. I I get tweeted all the time about you know somebody who might be. Uh, wanting to raise awareness for an illness, raise awareness for an injustice. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's a great privilege. It's a great privilege, privilege that, that I'm very lucky to have. Sure. Mm -hmm. So with social media, you have the, the opportunity to like step back, shut it off, respond when you want, ignore the trolls. But when you're live on television with other commentators and men are raising their voice at you and you are defending Latinos, you're defending women, you're defending others in the media. Honey, I can outshout anybody. No, <laughs> ma no man, let me just tell you. <laughs> His questions are I mean, what working. are you talking about, okay? I'm a, what, where Super are you going with this question? I'm a Latina from Miami. Yeah. I pity you if you think you're going to outshout me. <laughs> so you have a no holds barred style of commentary, and you don't mince your words, you don't pull your punches. What do you need to prepare for the shows that you're on when, you, when you're commentating? You know, I really don't think about what I'm going to say. What I do is I read a lot. I read a lot um, of, of, you know, the news of the day. And really it requires being on top of everything because right now news is a 24-7 cycle. And God knows Donald Trump gives you breaking news like on a, you know, daily, hour by hour uh, basis. And so, you know, it's really about being informed for me, my preparation is to to be informed. It's not a you know I don't. Some people come in with notes and they know what they're gonna say. I you know I I, I look I look at the way I came in here. You know I'm on my iPad multitasking because there's only so much attention I can pay to you guys, and <laughs> uh, you know that's Thanks. basically what I do. Um, so you've you've uh, you've said that the partisan divide is one of the biggest issues that we have in the country today. You're a Republican. What do you do or what media do you consume to get out of your own bubble? 
I try to consume uh, non partisan media. In other words, I don't do Fox News or I don't do Breitbart and I don't do, you know, uh, on the left, uh, HuffPost or, you know, or whatever. I try to consume journalistic, fact-based, less opinion-based media. So, you know, I will read the Washington Post and I'll read the New York Times and I'll read the Miami Herald and I'll read Politico. Um, I'll read CNN.com. I try to, you know, I try to to stick to that. Um, You didn't say NPR. You know, I don't listen to radio that much, Mm -hmm. to tell you the truth. I am a, uh, when I'm in the car, I'm like, uh, (laughs) I'm either listening to salsa or country. That's another, that's that's, that's also when I knew I had assimilated fully as an American, when like, I knew who Johnny Cash was and <laughs> can sing every lyric to every song. He loves peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> oh and uh, so, um, so I, I, I try to do that. But I do think that one of the problems that we face in America today is this polarization, where people too often only listen to, watch, read um, what they agree with, hang out with people that they agree with, that look like them, that sound like them, that think like them. And then I think we've got to get out of our comfort zone um, if we are ever going to beat this 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 cancer in our society right now of living in a red or blue world. You're missing the real colors in the world. For me, one of the one of the great things about my job and what I get to do is that I get to be with people who have completely different experiences, different thought processes, different ideologies, different you know, but. As long as you share values as human beings, who cares if you are, you know, if you are pro-science or anti-science? Who cares if you are, you know, if you want to be uh, in pro-trade or be anti-trade pact? I mean, you just, you know, you got to focus on the on the bigger things. And you learn how to debate civilly and you learn how to disagree civilly. I mean, life would be so boring if I was surrounded by people who all thought like oh, me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, up next is the impression session. Support for this podcast and the following message comes from Red Bull Radio. Whether it's the latest dancehall out of Kingston, techno from Berlin, underground hip-hop, or old soul gems, Red Bull Radio is the place to tune in and discover great music that's new to you. With in-depth interviews and live performances from festivals around the globe, plus music handpicked by influential artists, journalists, and DJs, You'll know what you're looking for when you hear it. Listen at RedBullRadio.com. Hey, y'all. Sam Sanders here. want to tell you about the only NPR show where you can hear about the latest White House drama and the return of TRL to MTV. The show is called It's Been a Minute. Every Friday, we catch up on the week of news and culture, everything. And every Tuesday, I sit down for some long interviews with authors, filmmakers, directors, and more. You can find It's Been a Minute on the NPR One app or wherever you get your podcasts. It's time for the impression session. No, it's actually time for Anna to check her Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> She's looking up impression session. <laughs> what well, does Anna, that mean? Anna, if we what is the attention. impression session? <laughs> um, here's how it works. We're going to play you each a song. We're not going to tell you what it is. And we just ask that you listen to it just for a few minutes and just let it seep into your soul, digest it, listen to the lyrics, listen to the music, Whatever brings out of you, that's what we want to hear. Cool? You want me to do what? <laughs> we, want, we want to listen to songs. We just want to, re- re- to react to music. Oh, Jesus. That's all. Okay, go yeah. ahead. 